Whenever Warren Buffett or Berkshire Hathaway make an investment, it's always worth taking notice. After all, Berkshire Hathaway is one of the most successful funds in the market, and Warren Buffett is one of the most successful investors out there. And therefore, when they make an investment, it's worth taking notice. And in this case, they've made a sizable investment in liquefied natural gas and the infrastructure associated with it. Berkshire Hathaway Energy has bought another 50% of the Cove Point LNG project. Now, Berkshire Hathaway Energy is a division within Berkshire Hathaway, rather unsurprisingly. And this, to some extent, is both a bet on that underlying asset, but also is clearly making a point about the LNG industry more generally and about the infrastructure associated with it. Now, in this transaction, Berkshire Hathaway Energy bought that additional 50% of the Cove Point LNG project. They already owned 25%, so now they own 75% in total, leaving just a minority stake owned by Brookfield Infrastructure. This means that Brookfield is now a passive owner, seemingly just riding along with what Berkshire Hathaway Energy is doing, because they appear to have a lot of management control and a lot of logistical control over the project. In their announcement, they specifically say, Berkshire Hathaway Energy today announced that it has executed an agreement to purchase Dominion Energy's 50% limited partnership in the Cove Point LNG business. Subject to applicable regulatory approvals, the approved interest will be held within Berkshire Hathaway Energy GTNS, a Berkshire Hathaway Energy business unit. A subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway Energy is also the current general partner and operator of Cove Point Natural Gas Pipeline and its LNG terminal facility located in Lusby, Maryland. The transaction is valued at $3.3 billion. It will be funded with cash on hand, including cash realized from the liquidation of certain investments. Upon closing, Berkshire Hathaway Energy will own a 75% limited partnership stake in Cove Point. A subsidiary of Brookfield will hold the remaining 25% limited partnership in Cove Point. In essence, they are now owning this vast majority stake in the Cove Point project. Now, according to Berkshire Hathaway Energy, Cove Point LNG is a rather successful and attractive investment. They state it's located in Lusby, Maryland, and is an LNG export facility in the continental United States. It's the first such facility on the East Coast. It is recognized as one of the most technically advanced and environmentally sensitive LNG facilities in the world. While working at the forefront of America's energy independence, LNG from the facility is also used to supplant coal-burning power plants and otherwise support energy needs in 28 different countries, playing a role in reducing global emissions. The Cove Point LNG terminal has a storage capacity of 14.6 billion cubic feet and a daily send-out capacity of 1.8 billion cubic feet. The terminal connects via its own pipeline to the major mid-Atlantic gas transmission systems of the Transcontinental Gas Pipeline, Columbia Gas Transmission and Eastern Gas Transmission and Storage. The Cove Point facility is unique amongst US LNG terminals for its operational flexibility and demonstrated ability to perform all the functions of an LNG facility, including import, export, vaporization, send out, and liquefaction. Okay, so what can we infer from this? Because clearly we can't go out and invest in Cove Point because it is an unlisted investment. Now, part of the reason for Berkshire Hathaway making this investment could have been that Cove Point was in fact unlisted and had a concentrated set of owners. It could have been the minion, the prior owner of that 50% stake, simply wanted to exit. And the academic literature tends to suggest that when you are acquiring an unlisted asset, that tends to be better for acquirers because they're able to capture an illiquidity discount. That is, they're giving liquid cash to the prior owner who had owned illiquid shares. So you're able to capture a bit of a discount by giving that liquidity to that prior owner. Furthermore, due to the general lack of competition for that stake, you can also capture a bit of a discount. So this would generally have been a good idea to acquire an unlisted asset for Berkshire Hathaway, holding all else equal. But clearly, we can't do that. But we can also look for the investment thesis behind LNG. Now, if we look at the natural gas price, well, natural gas has nosedived throughout 2023. It soared a little bit during 2022 on the back of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. However, it ultimately dropped off. Now, Berkshire Hathaway might be anticipating that natural gas is going to play a significant role in the so-called energy transition, as we're moving away from coal-fired power plants and the like, and more heavy polluting fossil fuels into cleaner sources of energy. Natural gas being a good stepping stone toward renewables, which the world will ultimately get toward. Therefore, they're anticipating that natural gas is going to remain a core part of the energy infrastructure for some time to come. And by acquiring assets within the infrastructure space, so the LNG terminals, they're able to perfectly leverage that position. Furthermore, they're looking at the LNG price, and they might be thinking to themselves, 
Well, natural gas has nosedived and it might not go down that much more. So they might be thinking the natural gas has hit a bit of a natural floor. So therefore now might be a reasonable time to buy into those facilities, knowing that the natural gas price might not dip down that much more because as coal is being phased out, we're going to need to move towards something and natural gas will be at least part of that something. So they might be anticipating at least no more declines in natural gas and therefore a decent time to start buying into that industry, both into natural gas production, but also more specifically here into natural gas infrastructure via the terminals. Because clearly when the natural gas is produced, it needs to be sent somewhere and that somewhere is going to be via the terminals. Berkshire Hathaway might also have just been trying to get control of that asset. So they didn't need to deal with yet another owner of the asset and the negotiations in the back and forth that might have gone on with that. So you might then be asking yourself, well, say, for example, there might be an investment thesis within natural gas. Say, for example, one believes there is a flaw in the natural gas price and it probably won't go down that much further. If you accept that as an underlying premise, well, how would you execute upon this and do something like what Berkshire Hathaway is doing? Well, here you'd be looking at the natural gas related stocks that are listed in the market. These might be companies, for example, such as Devon Energy, companies such as Chevron or Exxon, companies such as Chesapeake, for example, or Diamondback. Now, all of these companies aren't necessarily pure plays. For example, Devon Energy has oil and natural gas. Similarly with Exxon, similarly with Chevron, they all have multiple different sources of energy going on. And it's not just one. So if you're going to be buying into one of these, you will ultimately end up with exposure to other types of energy and other aspects that might influence the stock price. If we're looking at these stocks, we can think to ourselves, well, what would we be looking for in these companies? Now here we can identify a couple of criteria. First, we know that for many of these companies, there might not be a massive price catalyst. After all, for many of them, earnings are in fact expected to decline over the next year or two. So you might be expecting a relatively stagnant capital appreciation. So you'd at least want something that you are confident holding on to, feeling that it won't dip down that much more, but also something that has an adequate dividend yield so that if you're holding on to it and there is relatively little price movement, you're at least capturing a dividend. So if we do a filter like that, one of the leading contenders is something like Devon Energy, because Devon Energy has a dividend yield that is approximately 9%, give or take a bit. Admittedly, that's a trailing dividend yield, and those dividends could be cut if the earnings are bad, but still a reasonable dividend yield. It might have relatively stagnant price appreciation, but reasonable dividend yield. Now, if we were to look at, say, Devon Energy, we can see what analysts are suggesting. Now, in Simply Wall Street, analysts are giving about 18% price appreciation upside for Devon Energy. But again, analysts are also suggesting that earnings might start declining. So you do need to bear in mind things aren't necessarily clear cut. We can also look at priced earnings multiples. And here, the priced earnings multiple is relatively low for Devon Energy, particularly compared to its peers. If we look at the forward priced earnings multiple, we can see the forward priced earnings multiple is higher. And that in part might reflect the decline in earnings going forward. Now, these are basically taking the price divided by estimated earnings one year ahead. And if your earnings are expected to decline, then the denominator in that fraction will go down and your forward PE ratio will go up. Now, about half the analysts in fact set are giving Devon Energy a buy recommendation, which isn't necessarily overwhelming support. And that might reflect the trepidation surrounding the earnings forecasts. Now, those earnings declines seem to be relatively broad based, and that seems to be something that afflicts many of these companies in both oil and gas, possibly reflecting perhaps concerns about future oil prices, potentially on the back of China's reopening, not going quite as quickly as would be desirable, and possibly some of the transition away from fossil fuels, although clearly that isn't going to be immediate. Now, here I've been referring to analyst forecasts. If you're interested in getting those from Simply Wall Street, we can sign up for that using my link in the description below and get a hefty discount. Or alternatively, premium subscribers to my newsletter can also get access to analyst consensus forecasts on roughly a monthly basis for the S&P 500 and the ASX 200. So you can check that out, including my write-up in relation to this particular company in the description below. And in any case, do check those out. Hopefully, it'll be useful to you as a screen for companies to be able to focus your attention. But otherwise, thanks a lot for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe. And hopefully I see you next time as well.